So last time we just uh, we listed some examples. Let's actually go through them. Hopefully, we actually try some. So picking up right off, picking up with last time, we're going to do some examples here. Computational ones. I believe the first one. Example one A. Okay, so how do we do it based on the fundamental theorem? Well, what does the equation in the fundamental theorem say? We can compute this guy by doing what? Taking the limit as n approaches infinity. That's the definition of this. I mean, oh. in, by the, in the fundamental theorem of Tavos, we got a shortcut for how to compute this. What was that? Um, big F of B minus big F of A. Big F of B minus big F of A. And what is big F? The antiderivative. The antiderivative. So you want to find some that when you differentiate it, you get this guy. And by the way, sometimes this is written, and you'll see me start writing it now. A notation for this is to use, write something like, big F of X, and then you write a straight line, and then you put the B on top and the A on the bottom. And that's just a notation for, take the top number, plug it in, minus, take the bottom number, plug it in. That's a, a very standard notation. So if you see me write that, um, this means that, means exactly the same thing. Um, but a lot of times people would write this. And so what would be the antiderivative of our x squared? X to the third over three x to the third over three. So you write x to the third over three, write that line, zero, one. And that hints to you that you're going to want to find, uh, compute the number based on the fundamental theorem of calculus. So you're going to take the top number, you're going to plug in, that's the b, into the function, <coughs> minus, you're going to take the bottom number, and plug it. And we get one third, which was what we got when we computed it the long way. Similarly, here at B, we looked at minus 1 to 1 of x squared dx. This is going to be, of course, x cubed over 3. It's the same guy as that one. Except here, we're plugging in 1 and minus 1. Now, uh, if you plug in 1 in 1 cubed, minus, you plug in minus 1, minus 1 cubed, 3. And that will actually give you two-thirds. And what I want you to remember is that this is just a way to find the area under the curve. Um, I, I'll probably talk a little bit more about that at the end of today, if not tomorrow, about how you can interpret the symbols. Uh, but basically, this is, you have the graph x squared, and you're interested in the area under the curve, quote unquote, between zero and one. Whereas this one, is concerned about the area under the curve between minus one and one. So this one's under that. Now, you might have recalled that x squared is an even function, something that we call an even function. And so we realize that when you plug in either a negative x or a positive x, the same value, if you plug in the, if your x is replaced with negative x, you still get the same y value. That's a property of even functions. And basically what that means is um, the area on a balanced interval will be double. So that, that's, I can just use this as an excuse to mention that. That's something that from now on you can use to your advantage. Um, and I'll tell you something about odd functions as well. Something like this will always happen. or even functions. Right? So those are functions where f of minus x is equal to f of x. Right? We also can recognize them from their graphs because they're symmetric about the y-axis. If I take 
the right side of the graph, flip it over the y-axis, I get the left side of the graph. Um, those graphs, for those graphs, you will always have the fact that integrating from minus a to a of f of x is going to be actually just double the integral from 0 to a of f of x dx. And sometimes um, there will be a lot of situations where plugging in 0 is going to be very convenient as opposed to plugging in the negative of a. And so this is a property that will always work for even functions. Something similar will work for odd functions, but we'll talk about that when we get there. Let's uh, mention C. So, that, so that's a nice little blur. This can make computation very convenient. And you know, remembering something like that can help you now and through Calc 2, Calc 3. Um, you'll see a lot of situations where you can apply that to kind of essentially cut your work in half. Uh, so C. What is the antiderivative cosine? Sine. Positive sine. If I differentiate positive sine, I get positive cosine. So I'd write sine, I'd write that bar, 0 to pi over 2. So what this means, I'm going to plug in pi over 2 minus, I'm going to plug in 0. Sine of 0 is 0. What's sine of pi over 2? 1. 1. So that's 1. And the picture you can have here from a cosine looks like this. That's a 2 pi. At pi over 2 is where it hits here, pi over 2. And we just found that here. The area there is 1. Antiderivative of sine of x. Negative cosine. Negative cosine of x. Because if you differentiate negative cosine, you get minus minus sine of x. And that will give you that guy. And this is 2 to 0 to pi. So this is cosine of 2 pi minus and minus cosine of 0. Cosine of 2 pi is what? One. One. It's minus one. And this is, of course, plus cosine of zero. One. one. This actually gives you zero. Now, let's kind of explain what happened here. Because that's going to allow me to say something, again, general, that's going to be very convenient for you. Um, I'm I'm also teaching multivariate calculus this semester, and You'd be surprised how often this just came up, where we had this problem where it was huge, and then we just, by applying the idea I just told you, we cut it down to like, oh, we only care about this one thing because everyone else just died. Okay. So what you should notice is happening here, and this is also something that I'll emphasize later, is that when I say area under curve, I mean the net area under curve. So the idea is, when we apply this via Riemann sum, what happens is if we construct rectangles here, they would have positive heights, whereas if we constructed rectangles here, I'll talk about this a little later, but I just want to mention it. Whereas if I struck, construct rectangles to cover that part, the y values that I'm adding will be negative. And so what happens is when you're measuring an area that is underneath the x-axis, technically this guy gives you a negative area. And when you're measuring guys that are above the x-axis, this guy will give you a positive area. And why that is because of the way we constructed this, these rectangles, right? So we did it by delta x times the height of the rectangle. The height of the rectangle is given by the y value. So what that means is, if you're underneath the x-axis, your y values are negative, so you get a negative area. Whereas if you're above the x-axis, your y values are positive, so you get a positive area, the area that you normally think about. And so what basically happened here is that it found the area of this part as a positive number, but it ends up being exactly equal to the area of this part, which it computed as a negative area. And so 
When you see zero as the answer, it doesn't mean that there is no area under the function. It could be the case that there are parts, the function is both on top and bottom, and it actually has equal areas on the top and bottom, and they kind of cancel each other out. That's something I'll talk a little bit more about later, but I just wanted to introduce that idea to you just now. And in addition to that, I can introduce this idea, which if you're looking at any trig integrals in calculus 2 for definite integrals and you see a way to apply this, it is going to make your life a lot easier. Uh, so a general tip here. For sine and cosine. Integrating from 0 to 2 pi will always give you 0. So that's something that you're going to know, um, you can know right away. And in fact, we can generalize this. We can say anytime you're integrating over a multiple of the period of sine or cosine, the answer is going to be zero. So zero to two pi, it's going to be zero. If I do minus two pi to zero, it's going to be zero. If I do seven pi to nine pi, it's going to be zero. Once I'm spanning some multiple of two pi on the interval, the sine and the cosine integral will give you zero. So once this is a, and this is a plus or minus two pi times some integer, this guy will always return zero. And similarly here, the cosine will always give you zero. So you end up in a situation where you don't have to compute certain things because you're familiar with the pattern. And in fact, And, well, this is going a little bit back to pre-calc, but once you have the, an angle, say something like you saw sine of 2x or something like that, so like sine of kx dx, right? What would be the period of something like that? Well, that will be 2 pi divided by k. And so times some other integer and that's going to give you zero. And the, the same thing will happen for sine and cosine. So there were times when I would ask someone, we did some things that ended up like this. 0 to 2 pi, and we had like a sine cubed here, and then we had a cosine cubed here, and then we had uh, like a plus um, sine to something, and then maybe we had a minus cosine squared something else. So we'd see, I, I was, I, we were doing problems all the time where we always end up with something like this. And the trick here is that seeing that this is going to be a sine squared times a sine, and this is going to be a cosine squared times a cosine, and understanding that these parts are going to get, allow you to get a zero, which, I mean, you should do it the long way for one just to see why that is the case. It turns out that we could have ignored all of these parts. And we only had to worry about this guy. And then that guy you could change by the double angle formula into 1 plus 2 cosine 2 theta. And then we could ignore this part. So this entire thing, like you might start doing a problem and you might end up with a situation like this. But it turns out that if you know what to look for, it's really only you integrating a half. Right? So we'll, we'll start with problems and it will seem insanely complicated, but then you remember little tricks like this that I'm telling you, and no, that's super easy. And a lot of your classmates are going to spend a lot of time trying to figure out each of these guys, whereas if you know, oh, this always has effect. Once I'm integrating over a period, the period of this one is pi, the period of these each are 2 pi, I can actually get away with a lot here. 
So these tricks will come up a lot in uh, like Calc 2 and higher. So I'm teaching multivariable Calc this semester and this comes up all the time. So that's just a, another pro tip there. So there are times when you can learn certain tricks from doing, you do a bunch of definite integrals and you'll start to see certain patterns with certain functions. Um, so knowing that even functions, you only have to evaluate it on half the interval and double your answer. And knowing that if you're doing uh, integrating trick functions, if you cover their period, um, they'll actually give you zero. Um, that will be very convenient for you, computationally speaking. Let's move on a little bit. How do you guys do this one? Thoughts? Can you pull three out? Sure. <coughs> now what? And that's really one over cosine x times one over cosine x. And then you're going to get what? Do you see something? Secant squared. Yeah. Yeah, so that was the trick. So now it's under Use the tangent. So put on three wasn't wrong, but hopefully, if you did that, it would have triggered you to remember some other trick idea. Seeing that one over cosine might be better than seeing a three over cosine. Um, so yeah, this is actually just a fancy way of writing secant squared. So it's that. What's the antiderivative of secant squared? Tangent. So this comes tangent of the power of 3 minus 3 tangent of 0. Tangent of 0 we know is 0. What's tangent of the power of 3? Or you can remember it's tangent is sine over cosine. So this is sine of pi over 3 uh, plus divided by cosine of pi over 3. Right? I remember, then you hear, you can remember the table, you know, the 1, 2, 3, 3, 2, 1, the pi over 3 is uh, over here on the far right. So the sine is going to give you radical 3 over 2, the cosine is going to give you a half, and so that just becomes 3 right here. So yeah, you need to remember your trig identities. Just like with derivatives, um, simplifying before you try to apply a rule can do wonders for you. And um, at the very least, I'm glad that you guys didn't do 
um, a common mistake and try to apply the rules individually because we know that doesn't work, right? Because it didn't work for derivatives, it's not going to work for antiderivatives, right? So just like how for derivatives, there's a whole quotient rule to go over. Um, you can't just apply an integral to a product. It doesn't distribute across products nor divisions. So um, as long as you don't do that, it's not so bad. But whenever you see something, your first idea should be, can I simplify this? Can I rewrite it another way? And that might make life a lot easier. Uh, what about this one? It's just one. It's one. <laughs> All right. So basically, the advice I gave you here um, kicks in here um, right away. Antiderivative of one? X. X, right? Differentiate X, so you get one. This is 13 minus zero, so that's 13. What about this one? just do that now, just divide yeah. it into each, oh, yeah. right? So, it's equivalent. Bringing it to the top is just an extra step. I mean, technically it's not wrong, but you could yeah, just so realize that yeah, this yeah, is just... Easier for me to see. Yeah. So you could realize that this is just that. Yeah. So you could bring it to the top, rewrite as a power and distribute, you'll get here, take you two steps. If you see that quickly, just do it. Um, but you can also just... No, you can divide it into each. Um, what you don't want to do is, of course, apply it to the top and the bottom. Um, divide it, simplify. Now, how can we do this one? Um, is that 2 thirds x to 3 over 2? Right, add 1 to the power, divide by the new power. Dividing by 3 over 2 is the same as multiplying by 2 thirds. Add 1 to the power, you get a half. Divide by the new power, dividing by a half is the same as multiplying by 2. So we have that. Now, this one you have to be a little bit careful. Um, so here we're going to plug in the 4, 2 thirds, 4, 3 over 2, minus 6 times 4 to the 1 half, minus parentheses, right? Because we're subtracting something with several terms here. So we have to apply the distributive law. So don't forget that. I mean, I haven't been writing parentheses because usually we only have one thing, but you should be aware if there are several things. We need the distributive law here. So now I plug in one, I would get two thirds. Plug in one here, I would get six. So what is four to the three halves? Eight. It's eight. What is four to the half? Well, that's two. And this is minus two thirds plus six. So here, I have uh, 16 thirds minus 2 thirds, so that's 14 thirds. Here I have minus 2 sixes plus 1 six, so that's minus 6. And so 6 is 18 over 3, so I have 14 over 3 minus 18 over 3 minus 4 over 3. And here's that guy, when you get a negative answer, Geometrically, what you're interpreting that as is, this graph actually is, goes above and below the x-axis for a part of its thing, and the part that's below is larger than the part that's above. That's where the negative answer comes from.
Okay, how would we do this one? Distribute, because there's a product. There is a, a, an antiderivative version of the product rule. Um, if time permits, I'll talk about it, but you'll probably see that in, you'll definitely see it in talk two. Um, it's called integration by parts. Um, but you should know that you can just apply the antiderivatives to products, because even derivatives don't work across products. So the first thing is to just rewrite it. Simplify it to the x squared minus 2x. Then you take the antiderivative of each. And now you evaluate it according to the fundamental theorem of calculus. So 4 cubed is what? 64. 64 over 3 minus 16, which is what? 48 over 3? Yeah. And that's what? 16. Huh? 16. 16. Yeah, because this is 4 times 16, and that's 3 times 16, so it's 1 times 16. function, you will remember. Um, so when your x is 1 versus when your x is minus 1, right, the y value here is going to give you the negative y value there. And so you have equal areas on either side, except 1 will give you a positive area based on our construction for, for Riemann sums. Another one will give you a negative area based on our construction for Riemann sums. But in magnitudes, they're the same, and they actually cancel each other out. And it turns out something like this is really, it, re it really happens in general for any odd function. So there'll be a lot of times in Calc 2 or otherwise, you'll see a really complicated integral, but it's over what we call a balanced interval, which means it goes from a negative number to the positive number. And it turns out that that answer is zero. You don't have to justify it um, because you know the function is odd. That's usually easier to justify. And so this int in general for odd functions. Remember, an odd function is when you replace x with negative x, you get the negative of the original function. These are also the functions that are symmetric about the origin, which means if you take points and rotate them 180 degrees counterclockwise around the origin, you will fall right on top of other points in the function. Um, another way to look at that, flip it in the y-axis, then flip it in the x-axis, you'll get the other side of the function. And so for odd functions, it turns out that if you're integrating from minus a to a, the result is always zero because the portion from minus a to zero is going to be the negative of whatever it is from zero to a, and they will always cancel each other out. And so we can talk about a very complicated function that technically you don't know how to integrate. So I could throw something in like, now, to integrate that directly, Pretty much it's impossible. However, if I do like, oh, from minus 7 up to 7, easy. The answer is 0. Right. So that's, that'll come up every now and then. <coughs> this will always happen. And they will usually <coughs> refer to this as, you'll hear it phrased like this oftentimes, integral of an odd function. over a, it's called a balanced interval. So 
So that phrase balance interval means you're going from either side an equal distance away from the origin. Right? So balance interval just means your zero is here, you're going from minus a to a, it's the same distance. So the interval minus a to a is called a balanced interval. <coughs> if you integrate an even function on a balanced interval, then just integrate from zero to the top and double your answer. If you're integrating an odd function on a balanced interval, the answer is zero. You don't have to do anything. Because this something like this will always happen. Because we're getting positive y values on, the, on one side, and we're getting negative y values of the exact same magnitude on the other side. This is a property of odd functions. And so you can always use this trick. You don't really have to do anything. So I could give you here, and the moment you see that that's an x cubed, you could tell me, oh, the answer is zero. And you can say, why? It's an integral of an odd function on a balanced interval. You don't have to even go through the rules anymore. So that, that's another pro tip. Remember that, it'll save you a lot of headaches in Calc 2, Calc 3, and beyond. I had to kick that dog as you walked by. Let's do the second set of examples. I want you to find the derivative of the following functions. So 1 was g of x equals to 1 of x of sine. So find g prime of x. So g is a function defined in terms of an interval. Integral. Functions like that show up all the time, believe it or not. The best way we can interpret some idea is as an integral or an area, and we would define function as an integral. And we'd still like to do calculus on that. I find this derivative here. Cosine. Oh wait, no, no, no. You shouldn't have to do a lot of computation, and you shouldn't be finding the antiderivative. In fact, the antiderivative of sine of the radical of that. Um, it's, it's not possible. Here's the applied part two of the fundamental theorem of calculus. You can remember what that says and look back at it. Because this is uh, pretty much the textbook situation. You want to take the derivative of an integral, so what's going to happen? It's just sine of the square root of x squared plus 2. by the second fundamental theorem of calculus. Okay. 
no calculation is necessary. Even if you were able to find an antiderivative, you'll just differentiate that and get back to the same place. So why go anywhere? How about this one? Derivative. Oh, okay. So this is a function. I want you to find its derivative. What would g prime look like? Now, uh, one thing that's important is for you to realize. Um, you can't directly apply the second fundamental theorem of calculus here. Um, so when you look at the second FTC, this basically says that if you want to take the derivative of someone that looks like this, the result is going to be f of x. It's actually very important that the x is on top and the constant is on the bottom. Um, you'll notice here that things are actually reversed. So here's a useful fact, um, which I'll probably mention again when I talk about the properties of integrals. Uh, it turns out that if you have the integral from A to B of something, then you can actually swap the numbers on the integral. Not without consequence, though. You actually get the negative. Now, there are a couple ways you can see this. Uh, you can have an area argument. Think of it in terms of Riemann sums. Well, imagine that you flipped all the rectangles upside down. You'll get the negative area. Then you take the negative of that to get the original area. So you have an area argument. You also have a very nice argument from the fundamental theorem of calculus itself. So if you realize that this guy is really just big F of B minus big F of A, you can realize that that's just the negative of these guys in the reverse order. And so this guy, by the fundamental theorem again, is going to have the A on top and the B on the bottom. Okay. So there are a couple ways you can actually see that. So that's also a nice, useful trick that might come in handy a lot of times. Um, you can swap the limits on an integral just to put a negative sign in front. So this guy, the fundamental theorem of calculus, does not directly apply to it because, remember, we memorize our rules exactly anything that's out of place. You don't assume that you just apply the rule without consequence anymore. Constant on top, variable is on the bottom. Not good enough. I want the variable on top, constant on the bottom. Can I get that situation to happen? Yeah, that way. So. I would now just rewrite this as the negative of 4 of the x of cosine. And then apply the second fundamental theorem at this point. And that will give me the fact that g prime, the derivative of this, is going to just be the negative of cosine. You notice that this is also a very uh, strange situation um, because in our second fundamental <coughs> theorem of calculus, uh, we had x in the upper limit. Here we have an x cubed. Ideas on how to deal with that situation? Instead of an x, we have an x cubed. That probably reminds you of something. So you go to a basic rule of derivatives, and you swap out an x for an x cubed. How do you differentiate the same function? When you swap out x for anything.
So we know, for example, that if we were to differentiate something like x cubed, that's going to be 3x squared, just by applying the power rule. However, if I were to swap that x for something, and I ask you to differentiate, for example, x squared plus 1 cubed, what would you do now? Chain rule. Chain rule. Chain rule would take effect. You'll differentiate around the inside, multiply by the derivative of the inside. So once you swap out an x for some other function, uh, that tells you chain rule applies. And that's what we actually use here. So that's another useful tip. So the second FTC can be generalized via the chain rule. Now the chain rule says, differentiate as you normally would, leaving the inside function intact, then multiply by the derivative of that function afterwards. So in other words, we can say, if we wanted to differentiate something that looks like this, like a constant up to not x, but some other function, say g of x, f of t dt, then that would mean, first, just do what you would normally do. It says we just plug in the top limit. But then, because it's not just x, you have to apply the chain rule. It requires you to multiply afterwards by the derivative of that limit. So this is a more general version of the second fundamental theorem of calculus. It's just using it with the chain rule. So if you have something in your limit that's not just an x, just plug it in just like you would do with the x, but then multiply by the derivative because the chain rule will take effect. And so, with that being said here, that is equal to, well, I would just do what I normally do, take that guy, plug in here, because I have a constant down here and a function up there, I'm going to take the function and plug in for the p. But because it's not just x, I have to multiply by its derivative. So this guy ends up being 3x squared times the cube root of 2 plus x to the sixth. Chain. Our last example also has another useful fact built into it. So again, we want the derivative here. This was a function, d. This is p of x, and we want p prime. And here's an idea, which you could also do this by the fundamental <coughs> theorem of calculus, but this one I think it's intuitive enough to even go more basic than that, is suppose we had a function and we wanted to find the area from A to B, and it's this step. Right? So I know that will be the area from A to B of this function to this. Okay. It is possible that you could split the situation in two.
or even more parts. So what that would be would look like is something like this. Okay, so here's your A and B. But you know what? Let's cut this in two at a point C. Then it turns out I can also get to the total area by adding up the area of those two parts. So I can add up the area from A to C. And then I can add up the area from C to B. And what that would look like mathematically is someone can say, well, the area from A to B of our function is going to be the same as me saying the area from A to C of our function plus the area from C to B of the function. So we have this kind of idea that can work in general. You can actually, not only can you swap the limits on an integral by applying a minus sign, but you can break your intervals up. You can actually break an integral up into multiple integrals to expose uh, certain convenient points that you may want to challenge. And this, this is the intuitive idea, but technically the C could be anywhere. It doesn't have to be in between A and B. Um, by using the fundamental theorem of calculus, you'll realize this guy will give you big F of C minus F of A, plus this guy will give you big F of B minus F of C. The F of C will always cancel, and you will always get big F of B minus big F of A, which is what the original guy is. Right? So this works in general for any C that you can plug into the functions. Right? Now, how, do, how does that help us? Well, I know for the fundamental theorem of calculus to work, I need to be able to break this interval up into something convenient. So I'm simply going to break this into two integrals where the denominator is going to be a constant. I'm going to pick any constant I want. It doesn't even matter. So I can even put in a C there to represent any constant that's in the domain of the function. Um, so I might be given this situation, but the fundamental theorem of calculus doesn't apply. The second fundamental theorem doesn't apply directly. However, I can write it as something like this. I can let this guy go up to some constant c. And then add that to c up to the first guy. So I know how to deal with this using the chain rule. To deal with this one, I'm going to use the, the flipping rule that I showed you. So this will be minus c up to that guy plus c up to this guy. And now I can find k prime by applying the second fundamental theorem of calculus and the chain rule to each individual part. So this would look like minus sine of x squared plus 1 divided by x squared plus 1 times 2x plus sine of x cubed divided by x cubed times 3x squared. So that would look, I could start simplifying some things here. So this will cancel all of those. So I have something like 3 sine x cubed divided by x minus, well that one doesn't really simplify, 2x sine x squared plus 1 over x squared plus 1. And that would be the derivative of this function. Stop there. Pick up next time. Or next time I'll talk a little bit more about properties like this, but I really want to uh, do substitution. So maybe I might do that first. And I will see you guys tomorrow. Huh?
The quiz is on everything up, up to the first fundamental theorem of calculus. Okay.